pretty sparse today. Um, what I'm going to do today is to is to finish talking up uh, talking about the head related transfer function stuff that I started on Wednesday. Yeah, and then switch over to talk a little bit about sound synthesis, um, which is always fun. And um, so I think what we did last time was to talk about head-related transfer function, head-related impulse response. <clears throat> and that the response of, of, of your body and head and ears can be considered a linear, almost time-invariant filter. It's time invariant on the, on the scale of a audio cycle, but it, of course it varies over a period of seconds depending on how you're, which direction you're looking and how you're holding your shoulders relative to your ears and various things like that. But, <clears throat> but uh, the head-related transfer functions have been have been measured for something like um, a few hundred people and they fall into general categories but let's uh, I wanted to show you a little more data on this now the front row of, of chairs has moved closer to the to me that's why I feel trapped up here but um, we'll put the overhead projector as far back as we can without it tipping actually tipping off the table and maybe I'll have to break down and start bringing my laptop, as much as I hate it. What I hate is, uh, is uh, getting chalk in my laptop, actually. But since it's about ready to die anyway, maybe it doesn't matter. So, this is a grid. That's, a, that's an icon of a face in there with two little eyes. And then this is the side view, and you can see the nose there. And this array represents all the points in space where SIPIC measured the head-related transfer function. <clears throat> so again, you put the person in a bite bar, hold their head st stable, put crazy blue microphones into each ear, and then play impulse noises at them and measure the impulse response in both ears. Okay? And... So you get you get a uh, you get a uh, a different impulse response for each position in space for each ear, and that is what what you learn fairly quickly after you're born is how to interpret those impulse responses into a direction in space. There's quite a lot of variability. There's a there's a head related transfer function for um, or head related impulse function, but let's go to the head related transfer function, which is the Fourier transform of the head related impulse function. And you can see that there's an enormous amount of difference between individuals. This individual had a very sharp minus 48 dB notch at about 600 Hertz sorry 6,000 Hertz and nobody else had that notch although some of the other people had smaller notches at different frequencies and you would guess that if you were to take a standard average head related transfer function and play it to any given individual that it wouldn't sound much like the sound field coming around for the, the field coming around coming to their own head so for optimum response you really need to measure the the the, the effect for a human and for, for a given person and weirdly the civic database does not tell you any head measurements so it doesn't tell you whether this person had a wide head whether whether subject five had a wide head or a narrow head or big ears or small ears or ears on backwards or anything. So 
um, there's no way to normalize this, there's no way to calibrate it except to try a bunch of head related transfer functions from the database and see which one sounds the best to you. Now, the, the process of calculating the, the given, <coughs> given that you have the impulse response <coughs> for each year, so there's some time delay corresponding to the to the time before the sound gets to you, but given that you have the impulse response for each year, what you want to do is to use the impulse response as a matched filter. You want to use it as a uh, as a template for filtering uh, a sound so that it sounds like it's coming from some place in space. And, how, and the, the way you do that is based upon uh, the uh, convolution theorem is familiar. Convolution theorem. I learned it as the fall tongue theorem because some German originally did it. It says that if you have the impulse response, if you have the impulse response for a circuit. Now I'm just going to show you the impulse response for an RC circuit. If you have an impulse response for an RC circuit, um, which looks something like this, that, and you want to know, if you have that, and you want to know to a square wave, for instance, or any other shape function, what you do is you take the input and then you take the impulse response, fold it in time, reverse time, and then multiply at each time, multiply together the impulse response and the input. And what you'll get, uh, in the case of a square wave, of course, is you'll get something that looks like this. So, at each different time you want to calculate, you move the impulse response to that position. So, at the position that, we, that the, that the uh, function just starts up, the impulse response is just moving on to the waveform. As we get over here, the impulse response is moving off the waveform, and so only the tail is left, and that causes the tail down here. So you move the impulse response to different positions in time, calculate the overlap, the product of the values of the impulse function and the input, and mark that for that time, and then move to the next time. Well, this is equivalent to a finite impulse response filter, in which you have some input. which you're going to then multiply by some B1, which is going to be the first sample of the impulse response. This is now the first sample of the impulse response properly normalized. Added to a delayed version, a delayed version multiplied by the second sample of the impulse response added to a delayed, a one sample delayed version which is multiplied by the third sample and so on until we get to an output.
It's a lot of arithmetic. If you, if you go for the full SIPIC database head related transfer functions, there's 256 coefficients, so this goes out to B256. It's a lot of multiplies. There are various optimizations you can do. First of all, almost all of the energy of the impulse function is within the first, oh, say, 40 to 60 samples at 44.1 kHz. And that makes sense because the, the speed of sound across your head is is such that the average delay is something like half a millisecond. So if you go out a millisecond or a millisecond and a half, you expect to have most of the information. So the first thing you do is you say, forget this 256, I'm only going to go out to, to a sample of 60 or 128 or whatever you feel like, but you, you cut down the, the number of multiplies. And secondly, you don't have to do these all in parallel. You can do it as a sequential state machine, or for that matter, as a CPU, because you only need a new sample every 44 kilohertz, and each one of these multiplies can be done at 50 megahertz or 100 megahertz rate. So you can build a small state machine that just zips through the, the list. If you were to, say, limit, limit well, even if you went for the full 256 at 16-bit resolution, full 256 samples, you mean you need 256 registers at 16 bits. That just turns out as just about one M4K block. So you could put all of the coefficients in one M4K block. And the ring buffer, you know what a ring buffer is? A ring buffer for the input in another M4K block and shift them out in pairs, multiply them, shift them back into the ring buffer. And easily get done in time for the 44 kilohertz deadline. Now, there's some data management that's difficult because whenever the person, whenever you move the source relative to the head, even by two degrees, which is about the re which is the resolution of the SIPIC database, you need to reload all of the all of the coefficients. Which means you have to keep the whole set of coefficients for the whole head someplace in fast memory, so that you can grab a grab the current required set of coefficients and put them into the uh, convolution block, put them into the, uh, into the coefficients here. Uh, one year, had some students who did this who put the, all of the coefficients for all 256 data sets, or all 2,500 data sets into, into uh, static RAM, and then grabbed them out of static RAM into M4K blocks whenever the <clears throat> user moved the <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you move the mouse more than two degrees, which is how they were placing the rock and roll bands. They had two rock and roll bands playing um, in mono, and clicking the left button of the mouse allowed you to place one band in one spot in space, and clicking the right bu mouse button allowed you to click put the other band someplace else in space around you. And whenever you moved it more than two degrees, you you uh, they loaded up a new set of coefficients. And two degrees, they chose two degrees because that's about the resolution that humans can do. Dead front on, you could tell when something is a couple of degrees off axis, which is actually pretty amazing. Uh, owls do much better. They hunt at night. They hunt without vision. And um, they can do maybe four times better. Do half a degree. Get that mouse. So <clears throat> the brute force way is to just take the head-related impulse function, multiply in time 
by the sound you want to spatialize and you get a um, a sound that sounds like it's coming from some point in space. This is expensive enough. It work, works well on FPGA. It's not a problem on these FPGAs. You can do this calculation in real time and not have any problem. Uh, but people want to go cheaper, lower power. Whenever you do a lot of arithmetic, you're using a lot of power. And so one way to try and simplify, well, there's all kinds of ways to try and simplify. One is, I said, to cut down the number of samples that you're going to use. <clears throat> Another is to cut down the sample frequency, but that doesn't work so well because 20 microseconds is important. 20 microsecond samples are about what you have at 44 kilohertz. So people have done all kinds of stuff. One group took, well, let's draw out the the Fourier transform of this. So this is the head related transfer function. The Fourier transform of this looks something like looks something like this. You have almost a pure gain at low frequency. So this is log f here. And then some sort of complicated set of dips, and then something that looks like a comb filter. This is log amplitude. Now this is maybe a thousand hertz here, and this is maybe 10, 10 K hertz here. So one group, McKinsey and so on, said, well, all right, we're just going to fit this. We're going to do a brute force curve fit to a tenth order, ten pole IIR filter. And got fairly good results. <clears throat> but it's not very stable. It's hard to make a <clears throat> ten pole IIR filter stable because uh, it requires a lot of numerical precision. So it works in MATLAB. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it's not going to work very well uh, on a cheap 8-bit microcontroller. So another group took the approach that every one of these peaks could be represented by a, an, a resonator. Resonator is a is a, another term for a, the equivalent of a spring mass oscillator, an LC oscillator, which has a response that looks like this. And you get to fit two things. It's a second order system, so there's a second order. And you get to fit two things, the center frequency and the width of this peak. which if you're into RF is called the Q of the system or the full width half maximum or the bandwidth or whatever you want to say. But you get to choose the, f the frequency which is determined by the mass and the, if your thing is spring mass, it's by the it's square root of K over M. And the width of this is determined by the damping. If the damping is zero, the width is zero. So you get to choose the damping and the, and the natural frequency. And you can imagine fitting various of these resonators to various peaks here and doing a sum of resonator 1, resonator 2, resonator 3, and so on. And maybe add a notch filter to get to get the uh, notch that we saw maybe maybe here or here then put an amplifier in for the interaural intensity difference and then a delay in for the intraaural time delay and then feed this to the ear so there'd be one for the left ear and one for the right ear another one just like this for the right ear 
And then what you do is you would take these parameters, which are, are much lower bandwidth, presumably. It requires many less numbers to specify the resonators and the interaural intensity delay and the interaural time delay than it does to represent a 256 point transform. So not only is it easier to calculate this or lower bandwidth to calculate this, but you don't have to store as many numbers either. See, so it's less memory. Uh huh. It represents the response of your head to sound. To so any sound. Because it's, it's a linear function. So if you, you, you play clicks at somebody's head from a given direction, and the head-related transfer function is specific for that person with the sound coming from this direction. And every time you change the direction, the head-related transfer function changes. But since it is unique for each different direction, you can invert the problem and say, if we know the head-related transfer function, we know the direction. And that's what your brain does automatically. You don't have to think about it. There's just a big coprocessor in there that does this for you. <clears throat> so spe speech, speech is is generally in the range of 300 to 3,000 or so. A uh, little, little lower for male voices, a little higher for female voices, but only 100 hertz difference. And most people speak in the 300 to 3,000 range. And yes, there are peaks in here corresponding to the resonances of your throat. And you can use these to, to localize speech just as you would any other uh, sound. Long sounds of constant frequency, uh, particularly high frequency, are hard to localize. So if, if you have a or if you have a pure sine wave of that's long enough that it sounds pure and you don't have harmonics at each end of it, caused by the edge conditions then it is really hard to localize it because you have a phase ambiguity of different, which phase of which cycle adds up with which phase of the next cycle. And uh, I had a good example of this. My son lost a watch in his room when he was about seven. It, was, it went beep, beep, beep at 8 p.m. <clears throat> Every night at two to minutes to eight, we'd go up there and, and get ready and listen back to back, you know, so we were facing forward in different angles in the room, we never found it. Because even though it was plenty loud, you cannot localize a pure tone, particularly at high frequency where the phase ambiguity across your head is, is undetermined. Um, you can parse this even more. You can, one, other, one other group parses this in such a way to say, all right, we're going to low pass, band pass, and high pass the signal, whatever it is, whatever sound we're playing through the through here, we're going to low pass it. We're going to just treat this as a gain. So we set a gain corresponding to the interaural intensity delay. We set this gain up or down. Then in this region, we we do a third order IIR, do a third order infinite impulse response filter and just do the best we can with, with fitting it with another gain. And then up here we use a comb filter, which is a simple calculation. Put a comb filter up here with another gain to simulate the high frequencies. And what would be really interesting to do as a final project would be to compare these different methods on the FPGA, implement two of them, three of them, five of them, and um, see how they sound relative to one another, because I don't have any feel for this at all. 
I know that if you do the full impulse response and you're wearing good earphones, it's very compelling. Uh, I was at a graphic show once where they one of the, there was a VR company demoing. You put the helmet on so you've got visuals, but you also had audio. And what they had done was to record several people talking in a conversation around you, around the, the head-mounted display, but they hadn't recorded the images of the people, just the position of the microphones. And so you could close your eyes in this thing and you could point to it and then you could open your eyes and see how close you were to where the microphone was in virtual space. And it was amazingly good. Creepy, even. Because you, you had this conversation going on around you, but there was nobody there. Right? But, um, and you can do quite well with a full head related transfer function. Be interesting to see how well you could do with uh, these other schemes. Anybody thinking about doing this? Does that sound interesting? I think it would be fun to try and. Um, See if it was possible to measure head-related transfer functions on people and and sell them. And, you know, do some 3D modeling of their head. Have them put their ear up to the webcam, get a nice image of their ear, try and do a 3D extraction of their ear geometry. And that should give you enough information to simulate them. Calculate the head-related transfer function and then uh, sell it back to them. Humans are much less good at getting altitude of a, of, a, of a sound as opposed to the azimuth of a sound. You're quite good at azimuth. And that kind of makes sense. Most, most things of interest to humans are in a horizontal plane. Uh, you don't get attacked much from above, um, at least by traditional predators. <clears throat> um, and I, I can't remember what, what I think it th might have been in high school or middle school. They did a little experiment where they'd take a bell and ring it in front of our faces about a meter away, and we had to point to it with our eyes closed. And everybody was pretty good at, at doing this direction and were extremely variable, particularly if the sound was above about 45 degrees. So anything up overhead or in back of the head became almost random. You're just not good at getting particularly high frequency sounds in this field back here. Virtually all you do is if you hear something behind you is you turn around and look. And you're quite good in this, in this plane, but if it's completely behind you, you, you turn around and get the analysis going from the front. <laughs> So uh, I thought I'd switch over and start talking a little bit about uh, sound synthesis. And uh, particularly uh, instrumental or musical sound synthesis as opposed to say speech or environmental noise. And there's at least three different ways of doing this, all of which are used uh, commercially. The first one is uh, probably what you would come up with as engineers if you thought about it. One is spectral matching. You take the Fourier power spectrum of some source and you match it. So you say, all right, well, 
what does a string do? Let's say you pluck a guitar string. What is the what does the spectrum look like? And it turns out that that's a hard question because it's not stationary. It's a decaying system. And not only does the amplitude decay, but the order of loudness of the harmonics changes with time. So to make something that sounds like a string, let's say this is the fundamental F1 amplitude here. If you pluck a string, then F2 is quite often louder than F1 initially. And the amplitude of all of these of all of these different frequencies decays away exponentially. So if we look at the amplitude versus time of F1, we get something like this. If we look at the amplitude of F2, we get something like this, and F3 something like this. So that, yeah, no, these are, of course, relative because F2 is louder than F1 initially. So F2 decays more, way more quickly, which means that after a certain amount of time, F1 is going to be louder than F2. So to make something that sounds like a string, you need three or four harmonics with the second harmonic louder than the first harmonic to begin with, but decaying more quickly. Then it'll sound string-like. Well, that's kind of a pain to set up, but it's not that ridiculous. So you could, you could write this out in brute force as sum from i equals 1 to n. I'm sorry, of n from i equals 1 to n. Yeah, good. We'll get it. Uh, times some ai of t times sine omega t, of course. And to be at all realistic, you have to have a of t ai of t looks something like this. There's going to have to be at least an attack time. There's going to have to be some rise time here. There's going to have to be some more or less constant time and then some decay time. So at the very minimum, you're going to have to represent this as the product of two exponentials. This is, could be the product of an exponential that rises quickly times, the, times an exponential that falls slowly. Right. And if you wanted to just go a little bit further and say, well, OK, we're going to do spectral matching, but then we're going to fake it up a little bit. There's no particular reason why you have to use a sign here. You could use some other shape of a more complicated spectrum, and you wouldn't have exactly a Fourier analysis, but it might be interesting. But that will certainly produce something that's string-like. And then the, the interesting numerical part of this, which I'll talk about later, the interesting numerical part of this is to avoid to avoid ever calculating an exponential because exponentials are expensive you have to do a table lookup you have to interpolate so rather than do that it's much better to calculate a first order differential equation to get the exponential than it is to store a table of the differential the exponential In the case of a, yeah, Darwin. Is it always the case for standard musical notes that there's a fundamental frequency in the spectrum that's just a sum of integer multiple? 
Is it, so the question is, is it always the case that you have a fundamental in integer multiples? The answer is no. Uh, strings typically, yes. Strings typically are simple wave equation dominated resonance systems that have multiple, that who, with a, a fundamental that fits onto the string like this, right, with a node at each end. And then the, the, sec, the, the second harmonic is something that looks like this, and so on. So you have integer multiples. Horns are a little less obvious because you have some sort of bell at the end coming back to some sort of driver at the mouth. Driver is typically a high impedance source. It's a current source in, in, instead of a voltage source. So you can consider this a closed end. This is an open end. But since it's bell shaped, what exactly is the length of it? Turns out it depends on the note. And so the no so you, the, the effective length could be here or here, and it may depend on the note. So some notes are not quite harmonically related. For drums, as you know from the lab, the harmonic structure is very complicated. Uh, you can have uh, fundamental plus uh, harmonics at 1.5, 1.6, 2.1, 2.3, uh, 5.7 times the fundamental, depending on the shape of the drum. So, a guitar is nice because it is almost, you can model it almost as a impulse driven linear system. So, you pluck a string with your fingernail, you get a very sharp impulse drive to it, starting with a shape maybe that looks like this, you twang it, and then the system is free to, to respond. Turns out that uh, there's a very high frequency burst typically at the beginning, and if you were to model this at extremely short times, you'd find that there's some sort of noise spectrum on top of this. and You can make it sound more like a pluck string by adding a very short noise burst to this on the order of a few millisecond noise burst right at the beginning. To make it sound more like it's a pluck steel string. But um, a piano there's a huge amount of work in this because piano simulators are big money. Uh, a piano, first of all, some of the strings are thick, right? The low frequency strings are thick to the point where a, the wave equation does not adequate, adequately represent the forces. You have to go to a fourth derivative, right? So you have to, you have to, do, you have to model higher order derivatives to get the stiffness right. But even in the absence of that, you have three strings, first of all, and the strings are hit as a group by a hammer at some distance along their length. Hammer comes down, hits the string, string bounces down, comes back up and hits the hammer. Maybe several times. And so the hammer represents a nonlinear driving function because the, the impact against the hammer is, a, is, is, not a, is not smooth in time. So you get some very strange boundary condition there for a very short time that affects the overall tone of the instrument. And doing a good piano is really hard. I believe that current electronic pianos, sort of very good electronic pianos, use a combination of physical synthesis, which I haven't talked about yet. Spectral matching is just the first. The second is the second is empirical. Empirical uh, means 
I'm going to do some sort of mathematical operations to some sort of waveform and see what it sounds like. And if it sounds like a drum, I'll say, that's a drum synthesizer. If it sounds like a string, it's a string synthesizer. And, and uh, so-called FM techniques tend to fit into this category. The third is physical synthesis, where you brute force simulate the physics of the system, which is what we did with the drum simulator in lab three. It was a brute force differential equation simulator. And people do a combination of physical, empirical, and sampling for, for piano synthesizers. They'll simulate some of the physics of the string. They'll add in some completely random, or not completely random, but tested uh, arbitrary functions that make it sound more piano-like in some sense. And then for some frequency ranges and some time ranges, they'll bolt on samples from a real piano. So it's a complicated mix of synthesized and memory-based uh, synthesis. Well, I'll, I'll talk more about arithmetic next time. I have, I have C code that does all of these. And um, uh, based on for a microcontroller, the empirical is by far the most fun to play with. Well, let's see what happens if we if we FM modulate this waveform. You can make things that sound like a like a pluck string, or a like a like a like a saw blade that's been hit. You can make things that sound like drums. You can make it's just it's just the, it's so much fun. You waste hours doing it. Well, maybe it's not wasted, but it's sure it's a barely goal-directed play, at least. We'll talk more about it next time. Any questions?